Hello and welcome to another video. So sorry about the long break between my uploads. There's been a lot of stuff going on and uh, I've been really really busy but hopefully uh, I'm not that busy now so I should be able to upload on regular intervals. So with that being said let's uh, get started. So this topic is going to be about continuity and the intermediate value theorem. So we'll talk about continuity first and then we'll talk about in the intermediate value theorem or sometimes it's called the IVT for short. So let's get started. So what is continuity? Continuity just means that on a graph, suppose we call it f of x, there's no breakpoints. What does that mean? So suppose I draw an axis. So let me just draw a really quick axis like so. Continuity would just mean that if I have a graph that looks something like this. So let me just go ahead and draw it kind of like that. Notice how there's no breakpoints on this graph. So at any e value, there's a corresponding f of a value. And this e value could be anywhere. There's an e value here, there's an e value here, there's an e value here. Reg regardless of where I pick a as my value, there's no breakpoints. So there's no holes or jumps or asymptotes or anything weird like that going on. So, so that's what it means for a function to be continuous. There's a more formal definition. A function is said to be continuous at a point A if the limit as x approaches a point of a function is equal to the value of that function. So what does that mean? So let's do a bit more of a concrete example just to kind of demonstrate what it means for a function to be well continuous. So uh, let's, get, let's go right at it. So let's scroll down a little bit. Okay, so let's see, let's draw another axis. Okay, so suppose I have this graph right here, so let me use a different color for this. So here's an open dot here, and then this is a line that goes to the left, and then there's another line, this one is closed, and then this one goes this way. Okay. So, so suppose that this point right there is the value of 1, and that's 0, so the y value, just to be clear. So this is known as the heaviside function, or sometimes it's called the switch function. It's a very useful application used in electrical engineering to demonstrate how to kind of represent on and off, but I mean, I'm getting off topic here. So that being said, let's uh, write down the definition of this. So in this case, h of t, which is, so h is, as I mentioned earlier, h is called the heaviside function, but regardless, I'm just saying a function, h of t. So in this situation, it's 0 when t is less than 0, and it's 1 when t is bigger than or equal to 0. Okay, so is this continuous everywhere on its interval? It's not. And the reason it's not continuous is because if I take the limit as, so that's a really bad M. So if I take the limit as, uh, not X, T approaches zero from the left of H of T, uh, this is not equal to H of zero. And the reason for that is because the limit as T approaches zero from the left, that's zero. So zero. And the value of h of 0, according to this definition, is 1. And 0 does not equal 1. So the function is not continuous across its entire interval. So, for example, here, in this kind of arbitrary graph, it was continuous because I could take the limit across all points, regardless of direction, and I would get the same value. Another kind of a shortcut of saying this is I should be able to draw the graph without ever taking off my finger. So right here, I can draw a graph, that's fine, but here I have to take off my finger, go up here, and then continue here. So if I have to do that, the function isn't continuous. So that's kind of a quick and dirty way of doing that. Okay, so let's keep going. So these are all sort of equivalent statements for a function to be continuous. So let's write them down, so some properties. So some properties of continuity.
So let's go ahead and underline that just to be really clear. Okay, so the first property, as we already talked about, is that the limit as x approaches a of f of x must equal the value at that point. Okay, the next one is just kind of straightforward. This one is just saying the limit as x approaches a from the left of f of x must equal the function at that point. I mean, that's kind of obvious. It's the same thing. The same thing with the other one, as you can probably guess, the limit as x approaches a from the right of f of x, that also has to equal f of a. So it's kind of the same idea here. So what I'm getting at is that regardless of the direction in which you approach from, they all have equal f of a. Consequently, we can also write this down. The limit as x approaches a from the left of f of x must equal the limit as x approaches a from the right of f of x. So this is probably the most useful property, but uh, regardless, it's, they all kind of saying the same thing. All I'm saying here, once again, is that the direction in which you approach the limit from, it doesn't matter. They all have to be the same regardless. So let's do a quick kind of example to demonstrate the idea of continuity. And let's see here. Yeah, okay. So let's do this really quick example. Uh, so let's go ahead and do this in green, I suppose. So suppose I have this graph that looks like this. Okay. And let's suppose I also have this graph that kind of looks so it's kind of like this. So there's an open dot there. Goes down and then kind of looks like that. And then let's see here. There's going to be a little bit of an open dot there. Goes down. There's an open dot there. And then goes up. Okay, so let's go ahead and plot these a little bit. So that's going to be, let's say that's a 1. Let's say that's 2. Uh, suppose that's 3. Uh, let's see, let's call that point 4. Let's say that's uh, 5. And let's see, let's call this uh, point f of 5 right there. So, so this close kind of data is denoted as f of 5. Uh, let's see, let's call this point right there, this open dot, let's call that f of 1. And let's finally, let's call this point right there at the bottom, let's call that f of 3. So that's, uh, so there, 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 and there. So let's call this y, let's call that x. Okay, so let's see here. Okay, so let's go ahead and do a few kind of thought examples just kind of get you in the swing of things so x equals one so does f of one equal the limit as x approaches one f of x so in other words does f of one equal the limit as x approaches one of f of x well no it, it doesn't and the reason for, for that is because f of 1 is not even defined at 1. There's an open dot there, so no. So that's fine. So if it's not even defined at 1, then, you know, it's not continuous. Okay, next one. So let's suppose we have x equals 3 now. So does, so just to be consistent, does f of 3 equal the limit as x approaches 3 of f of x. Well, okay, f of 3 in this situation is equal to right there. And then the limit as x approaches 3 of f of x, well, that doesn't actually exist because as you approach from the left, so let me use a different color for this, as I approach x equals 3 from the left, I get this bottom value. But as I approach x equals 3 from the right, I get this top value. So the, so the limit doesn't actually exist. So that's, uh, that's not good. So as a result, that's also not continuous. So let me just kind of undo that eraser by accident. Uh, yeah. 
So let's go ahead and fix that a little bit. There we go. Okay, so does the function equal the limit? No. F of 3 exists, but the limit doesn't exist. So, no. I'm actually going to write that in red as well. So, no. So, in the first one, F of 3 not defined. And in this situation, the limit doesn't exist. Okay, what about the next one? So in this situation, we have x equals 5. Well, the problem with this one is that at x equals 5, so let me just actually, let me just actually write that down just to be consistent with everything. So at x equals 5, so does f of 5 equal the limit as x approaches uh, 5 of f of x? Well, that's certainly not, that's not true. F of 5 is up here, but the limit as x approaches 5 from both directions is this point right there. So the limit does not equal the y value. So no, that's not true. So different y values. No. F of 5 does not equal the limit because there's different y values. The limit equals this point, but the y value is up here. So that's not true. Okay, so as a result, none of these uh, none of these uh, it's not continuous across any of these points. It might be continuous over like a small interval, like for example, that's certainly continuous, and like this section is continuous, but this overall its entire domain it's not continuous. Because for example, once again, if I draw this graph, I have to take off my pencil up here, continue, and then take off my pencil again here, continue. Start, take off my pencil again and then continue on. So using that definition, I can't, oops, sorry about that. Using that definition, I can't possibly uh, determine that this is a continuous function. It's not. So you gotta be very careful about that. So let me just kind of erase the red parts a little bit. There we go. Okay, so there's that. Now, Let's do another example where it, where it is continuous. So this one is a very simple example. So I'm just gonna kind of do this a little bit quickly. Oops, let me just draw a graph. There we go. So suppose I'll take parabola y equals x squared. So y equals x squared. Okay, so is this continuous at zero? So is y equals x squared continuous? at x equals zero. Yeah, it is. And the reason for that is because the limit, so let's go ahead and do this, the limit as x approaches zero of x squared is equal to f of zero. Well, what's the limit? Well, that's obviously zero. And what's f of zero? Well, that's equal to zero as well. So they're equal, so yes, it is continuous at zero. Okay, so that's not too bad at all. Now, let's do a interesting sort of example. But before we get into that uh, example, there's a few things I need to talk about for, about common kind of functions. So what do I mean by that? So the following functions are always continuous just because, well, it's kind of obvious. If you want a proof of it, uh, leave, leave, a, some, leave something in the comments and I can make another video about it. But Hopefully, you'll be able to kind of recognize that the following are kind of the following by definition are supposed to be continuous. So some other properties. So I'm going to use white for this part. Uh, so properties. Okay. So some very basic properties. Properties. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. If f of x and g of x are continuous functions, then f plus g is continuous f minus g is continuous, a constant times a function is continuous, the product of the two functions is continuous, and then the quotient of the two functions are also continuous. Of course, this is assuming that g does not equal zero. So this is under the assumption that f of x, which I'm just gonna denote as f, and g of x, which once again, I'm gonna denote as g, if both of these are continuous functions, so if f and g are continuous, 
the following properties right there they hold. So that should be fairly obvious. I mean, if I have two continuous functions and I add them, they're going to be continuous. If I take a difference of it, that's also going to be continuous. Scaling a continuous function is not going to affect anything. Multiplying two continuous functions is not going to change anything. And if the both functions are continuous, then dividing it is also going to be continuous, usually, um, assuming that g does not equal zero. Okay, and then the next part is the types of functions that are continuous. Again, most of these are fairly obvious, um, but you have to be very careful about it, uh, about some of the definitions you use. So let's go ahead and use a different color for this. So the following are always continuous. So the following are always continuous. And I'm gonna write this part in red because a lot of people miss this part. The following are always continuous over its domain. This is actually a really old exam question that was tested a while ago, back when I was taking calculus in university. Um, the, the examiner put, oh, is this function continuous? A lot of people say, no, it's undefined. But the trick was that that undefined part wasn't even on its domain. So it was continuous regardless of, you know, any undefined points or something. So we'll do an example of that kind of situation later if you have time, but let's just keep going. So the following are always continuous. So let's go ahead and do this. So polynomials are always continuous. This should be kind of obvious. The next one is a trigonometric function. So trig functions are always continuous. The next one is an exponential function. So you might be thinking, oh, but tan is undefined. It's not. I say it over its domain. So you gotta be very careful. Over its domain, tan is de is most definitely continuous. So you gotta be very, very careful about that. So the next one is the exponential functions. So exponential functions, that should be fairly obvious. So functions. The next one is rational functions. So rational functions. The next one is logarithmic functions. And the last one is root functions. So square root of x, square root, key root of x, things like that. And the other thing you gotta be careful about is once again, you might be saying, oh, but the square root is undefined for all values of x less than, z less than zero. It, we, yes, that's true, but again, over its domain. So over its domain, the square root of x is continuous. So you gotta be very careful about that. Okay, so here's a very interesting question. This is actually an old exam question that was tested back when I was in university. Um, so this will be good practice. So let's go ahead and do that. So suppose I tell you that f of x is equal to, so let's go ahead and write this down. Uh, let's see, x squared plus ax plus b. And then let's see, the first, second part is 2x sine of, uh, let, wait, I just got to check something, uh, sine of pi over 2 times x uh, plus b cosine of pi over 2 uh, let's see yep that's good and then let's see we have x squared minus 4 divided by x squared minus 3x plus 2 plus e to the 1 over 2 minus x and then there's a few restrictions to this. So this one is going to be x is less than negative 1. This one is x is between negative 1 and 2. And this one is x is bigger than 2. Okay, so find, so the question was, so find all values of a and b such that f of x is continuous. Okay, so this might seem a bit weird at first, but you'll see it's actually not too bad once you get the hang of it. 
Okay, so remember for a function a function to be continuous, it had the limit at every point has to equal the function at that point. So for example, the limit as x approaches negative one as um, uh, the limit as x approaches negative one of this function has to equal the value at negative one. So let's go ahead and do that. So the limit, so let me just use a different color for this. So the limit as x approaches negative one of f of x equals f of negative one. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. So if I go ahead and do this, so let's, yeah. So in this situation, I can plug in negative one for this second one, because that's when the equal sign actually appears. And then for this one, I just gotta take the limit. So in this situation, we gotta take the limit as x approaches negative one of, let's see, it's gonna be x squared plus ax plus b is equal to two times negative one sine of pi over two times negative one plus b cosine of pi pi over two times negative one Okay, so if you go ahead and simplify all of this, you're going to get, let's see, on the left-hand side, you're going to get negative 1 squared minus a plus b. So that's going to be 1 minus a plus b is equal to, okay, on this side, the cosine part is going to be 0. So you end up getting, uh, let's see, that's going to be negative 2 sine of minus pi over 2. So that's going to give you a 2. And then on this side let's see so you're going to get if you simplify all of this you're going to get b minus a equals one so that's one system of equations okay and then let's see the next one so we have now got one system of equations so we need another set of equations to to solve for a and b so let's go ahead and do that Okay, so we use the fact that it's going to be equal to negative 1, and then we can do the limit as well. And then for the second half, we can do kind of the same thing. We're going to take the value as it's equal to 2, and then we're going to check the limit as the function approaches 2 and see if those are equal. And then using that same property, we can use it to get another system of equations. Okay, so let's go ahead and do that. So in other words, the limit as x approaches 2, sorry, my pen is a little bit weird all of a sudden. So the limit as x approaches 2, there we go, sorry about that. So the limit as x approaches 2 of f of x must equal the value at 2 itself. Okay, so let's go to the right side first because that's a little bit easier. So if I were to plug in f of 2, well, that's going to give me, well, let's see here. Uh, okay, so what happens here? So in this situation, we have this kind of mess for 2. So if we go ahead and do that, so f of 2, that's equal to 2 times 2 sine of pi over 2 times 2 plus b cosine of pi over 2 times 2. And if I go ahead and simplify this, we get 4 sine of pi. Well, that's 0. And then we get b cosine of pi over 2 times 2. So that's going to be b times negative 1 or negative b. And then for the limit, we got to, well, for the, the limit is a little bit harder. So let's go ahead and do that separately. So we got to be a little bit careful here. For this one, notice we're taking the limit as x approaches 2 from the right. That's, that distinction is going to be very important because if we were 
to do it from the left, this limit would actually not be possible. So let's be very careful with, about that. The reason it's approaching from right is because x is bigger than 2. So when the limit as x approaches 2 is when we do the limit as x approaches 2, we have to do it from the right. So let's go ahead and do that. So what happens when the what happens to the limit? The limit as x approaches 2 from the right. Okay, so of uh, fx. Let's go ahead and move that down. Okay. So that's going to be equal to the limit as x approaches 2 from the right. Uh, let's see. So this one is going to be x squared minus 4 divided by x squared minus 3x plus 2 plus e to the 1 over 2 minus x. Okay, so let's do this a little bit slowly. This one, this one isn't so bad. This can just be written as a factor. So we can use the limit properties where we can split this as the sum of two limits. And I know we can split it because the limits are going to exist. They have to, otherwise the function wouldn't be continuous. So let's go ahead and split this. So x squared over 4, x squared minus 4, sorry, over x squared minus 3x plus 2 plus, let's see, the limit as x approaches 2 from the right of e to the 1 over 2 minus x. Okay, so let's go ahead and simplify this a little bit more. Notice that this can be factored. So if I go ahead and factor this, we get the limit as x approaches 2 from the right. Uh, let's see, that's going to be x plus 2, x minus 2, and then this bottom, that's going to be x minus 2, that's going to be x minus 1, and then that's not too bad. We're going to leave, we're going to leave this limit alone for a bit. Okay, now conveniently this cancels, and then we can plug in a 2, so that's going to give us 4. And then we have the limit as x approaches 2 from the right of e to the 1 over 2 minus x. So let's go ahead and write this down. Okay, now what about this limit? This limit, we can't just plug in a 2 uh, because that would give us 1 over, well, 0. That's undefined. But, we got, but if you notice this, this is the limit as x approaches 2 from the right. So it's more like, it's for example, it's going from 4 to 3. And then it's going to 2, and then it's going to 1. It's oh, sorry, there shouldn't be a 1 there. But the point is, like, it's going from a bigger number to 2. It's not going from a smaller number to 2. And that distinction is very important because that's going to help us, well, a little bit later. So suppose I plug in a number that's very, very close to 2, but slightly larger than 2. So that's going to give us. Let's see, that's going to give us e to the power of. So I'm just, I'm just going to do this on the side using a different color. So that's going to give us e to the 1 over 2 minus, let's pick a number that's just a little bit bigger than 2. So 2.001. Okay, well that's going to give me e over, e, sorry, e to the power of, well that's going to give me minus 0 0.001. Okay, and then of course 1 over a really small number is very big. So that's going to give me e to the power of minus 1000. And consequently, that's going to be e to the power of 1000. And that's going to be really small. But what if I make this even smaller? So like 2.0000000, like all the way to 0 and then 1. That's going to be really small. But the point is, but the point I'm trying to make is that eventually, as this difference goes to 0, that's eventually going to go to zero as well. So what I'm trying to say is the limit as two x approaches two from the right, this difference is going to get so small that you're going to get a really small exponential. And eventually, as that limit gets closer and closer to zero, as in this limit, this difference rather, as it gets closer and closer to zero, this exponential as a result is going to eventually go to zero. So this limit is actually equal to zero. So that makes things very nice. So let's switch back to blue. So this limit right there is equal to zero. So we get four plus zero. And then as we checked earlier, f of two was equal to minus b. 
So minus b is equal to 4. So consequently, b equals negative 4. Okay, so we're almost done. We also have this equation that b minus a equals 1. So let's go ahead and write that down there. So b minus a equals 1. And then negative 4 minus a equals 1. So minus 4 minus 1 equals a. And then minus 5 equals a. So there's that. So that wasn't so bad. Okay, so we're almost done now. And that's it. We are basically shown that for some... So for a equals negative 5 and b equals negative 4, this function is continuous. And that's it. So that basically takes care of continuity. And I believe that covers everything you can talk about for the purposes of continuity at least. And probably just about anything you can cover for like an exam or something. Okay, now let's talk about something new called the intermediate value theorem. So what is so that's a very simple theorem. So let's go ahead and write that down. So I'm gonna use white for this one. So the intermediate value theorem. So intermediate value theorem. So sometimes it's called the IVT. Okay, so this theorem is very simple. There, is a, there, is a, there are a few caveats, but I will specify that as needed. So let's use blue and let's use a graph. So suppose I have a continuous function on the closed interval from A to B. So here's my graph. So let's suppose we call that A, and then let's suppose we call that uh, F of A. And suppose furthermore, I call this uh, B. So let's go ahead and specify that. So let's suppose I call that B. And suppose I call this value. No, sorry about that. It keeps erasing for some reason. So that's going to be F of B. So the intermediate value theorem is very simple. It just says that between on the interval from F of on the inter, on the closed interval A to B, there is a y equals k such that at some point x, it's equal to the value. Now, again, that might seem a little bit complicated, so let's kind of digest that a little bit. On the closed interval e to b, so on the closed interval e to b, and let n, okay, so let's be really clear about this. This has to be a closed interval. Next, let n be a, any number between f of a and f of b. So let's call this value n right there. Okay. There exists a number on the open interval e to b such that f of c equals n. So what does that mean? So let's again digest it. Let's just digest this very carefully. On the closed interval from a to b, there is a number n such that f of c equals n. What does that mean? I'm basically saying that between the closed interval a to b, every number in between f of a and f of b has to exist if the function is kind of if the function is continuous. Now that's kind of obvious if you think about it. If a function is you know continuous, so if it's let's say it's a random kind of graph like this, and this right there is f of a, and this right there up there, let's call let's call this f of b, and let's say that this right there is uh, a. And let's say that this is b right there. Well, if I'm saying the function is continuous from e to b, so that would be and that would mean that every value between f of a and f of b has to exist. So for example, this value has to exist, this value has to exist, this value has to exist, this one has to exist, this one, this one, this one. Every value between f of a and f of b, they all have to exist. So it's kind of the same idea here. So if I call that n, for example, sorry about that, the screen just jumped. So if I call that n, every value in between has to exist. So for example, n1 has to exist, that's this point right there, n2 has to exist right there, every value in between has to exist. And that should be, kind of make sense. So let's call it c1, c2. So I'm just saying that for every value in between f of a and f of b, 
the y values in between all of the exist if the function is continuous for some corresponding x value. So for example, between f of a and f of b, f of c equals n, f of c1, uh, let me just fix that, c1 is equal to n1, f of c2 equals n2. So every value in between f of a and f of b have to exist for some corresponding x value. And now you might be asking, well, how is this useful? Well, the reason that this is useful is because it lets us do things that would have otherwise been really difficult to do. You might be asking what I, what I mean by that. Let's just take a look at some really quick examples to kind of demonstrate my point here. So here's a very quick example. So show that there is a root of the equation four x cubed minus six x squared plus three x minus two equals zero. So basically I'm show I'm trying to show that there is at least one root, or I should probably specify that show that there is at least a root, at least one root uh, let me just fix that. So at least one root to the equation. Okay, so there's at least one root to the equation 4x cubed minus 6x squared plus 3x minus 2 equals 0. So by root, I mean uh, the root of an algebraic equation just means that it intersects the uh, x-axis. So basically, there's a solution to this equation. There could be more, but the point is I'm, I'm trying to show there's at least one. So how do I do that? Well, according to the intermediate value theorem, I have to show... I every value between f of a and f of b have to exist for some corresponding value for x. So what does that mean? How does that help us with this kind of question right here? Well, suppose this is, a poly, this is clearly a polynomial. So let's define f of x as 4x cubed minus 6x squared plus 3x minus 2. Okay, that would mean that if I could show that this is negative at some point, and that this is positive at some point because that's a continuous function it has to go from negative to positive and if that's the case it must have crossed the x-axis so what is what does that mean that might seem a little bit confusing so let's just kind of think about this for a second so let's just randomly guess some values that might seem a bit absurd at this point but just bear with me so suppose i tell you that f of one is something. So if I go ahead and plug it in, you'll get that f of 1 equals negative 1. So let's make that a bit clearer. So f of 1, that's equal to negative 1. So furthermore, suppose I tell you what f of 2 is. So let's go ahead and plug that in, and if you plug it in, you'll get 12. Okay, so let's go ahead and kind of draw this a little bit. Now, I must emphasize that I don't know what this graph looks like, but I do know that f of 1 equals negative 1. So let's go ahead and draw that. So that's like here. And I know that f of 2 equals 12. So that's like about here. And this is a cubic. I don't know what a, like generally a cubic looks like this, but I don't know what shape it looks like. But I do know that this point right there. So that's, let's see, that's 1. That's f of 1. And then, so let's make that really clear. So that's 1. And then this point right there, that's a 2, and that's 12. Okay, I know that because this is a continuous function, because as I mentioned way back here, polynomials are always continuous. So I know that this is a continuous function, and I know it's continuous on the interval from 1 to 2. So it's continuous on a closed interval, one to two. So that means I must have, it's so in order to reach from f equals one, f of one to f of two, I must have crossed the x-axis. 
Now, I don't know where I crossed the x-axis, but I know I must have crossed it at some point because it's a continuous function. I can't just I can't just suddenly jump like that. Like that doesn't make any sense. So in order to cross from negative one, so let me just really emphasize that to be clear, just to be consistent. So that's f of two, and that's 12. So in order to go from y equals negative one to y equals 12, I must have crossed the x-axis because it's a continuous function. And according to the intermediate value theorem, if, if the function is continuous on a closed interval from a to b, I must, every value in between must exist. So in order to get from negative one to 12, I must have crossed zero. I must have, like that's that should be common sense. And because I crossed zero, there is an x equals c such that f of c equals zero. I don't know what that c value is, like I don't know where it exists or whatever, but I know that I must have crossed it. So hopefully that makes some sense. And because I crossed the x-axis, I know there's at least one root. So therefore, by IVT, there is at least one root. Okay, so because there's at least one root, I have not concluded that, yep, so my show there's at least one root, yep, I've just done that. It So f of one is negative, f of two is positive, and because this is a continuous function, IVT applies, and then at some x equals c, I must have crossed the x-axis. So y was zero for some particular x value of c. I don't know what it is, but that's, I don't care about that. I just want to show there's at least one root. It's possible to find it using like the do if you want to actually find a root, it's probably possible to do it using numerical methods or Newton's method or some other weird things like that, but you don't need to know any of that. So not too bad. So that basically covers the intermediate value theorem. And I hope this video helped. If you've this video helped, please remember to like, comment, subscribe, and if you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment. Thanks.